And now, the survival show that once survived, A Frying Pan to the Head, by James. In this episode, we sit down with James Price. He's going to lift up the skirt on the tactical training industry and show us what's really going on. He's also going to share with us where many of us are training for the wrong thing in the wrong way. Howdy and welcome to In the Rabbit Holes, Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 217. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Remember, ITRH is technically on summer break. The show will be back in full swing for season seven starting August 7th, 2017. In the meantime, you will receive an ITRH Summer Shorts episode every three weeks. Then August 7th, we'll be back. This is going to be a full length episode as an exception and encore. Now, before we dive into the episode, I'd like to set the stage a bit. We begin and end every episode with a simple message. It's our motto and the thing ITRH promises. In fact, it's the ITRH tagline. Stay safe and sound. We spend most of our time on the safe part. That's the exciting stuff, right? But it's important to address the sound part from time to time. And sound means sound in mind. This impacts to doing things for the right reasons, preparing or and nailing down are perhaps starting with the most likely and making the most out of our limited time and resources we have. About a decade ago, you would have found Jonathan, Jason, and myself and a few other friends feverishly looking up tactical schools and gear. But there was a problem with what we were doing. We were acquiring skills starting from the least likely. This can also be said about the gear we were acquiring. This episode addresses that. And I do want to point out my scope of what I'm concerned about and see as possible are more broad than James. But the core message is the same. Train the way we prepare. Start with and master the most likely first. With that. So as an encore, you know, we've been talking a lot lately about skills and have kind of pushing, if, if y'all didn't get that, I've been pushing for people to get out this summer and get some classes and get some skills and spend less time buying gear and more times filling your head with wonderful knowledge. And James and I were talking, he had a, a thing that he really wanted to talk about, which was a, a no bullshit view uh, and the things to be aware of when you're going out to these tactical schools and things like that, because there is at the end of the day, marketing and marketing with the intent to get you to buy things. And there's a good, there's a place for marketing. Good marketing does good things. Bad marketing does dumb things and gets you to spend money uselessly. And so today we are going to lift up the skirt on tactical schools. James, welcome back to In the Rabbit Hole for the season six Encore episode. Oh, great. I get to be on the Encore. That's awesome, man. So I get all the special episodes. <laughs> it's great to be back. It's, it's real good to be back. It's good to see you again. I mean, we've been talking about this kind of on and off, like in phase two, about some of the things that go on in the firearms training industry, because I, I was briefly in it for a couple of years, and now I don't really teach commercial classes anymore. I do some get, guest teaching occasionally, and I mostly just train people going overseas with our mission teams. But now that I'm not really in the industry, not that I really was, I was never really a, a dude bro guy in the tactical training industry. So now that I'm not, don't really worry about burning any bridges, I wanted to kind of go over some what I call shenanigans in the <laughs> firearm training industry uh -huh. and things that you should be aware of. But before I start, first thing I want to say is I'm not being overly critical of, of training companies. I understand you have to make a living. I look at firearm training schools very much like martial arts schools. In order to pay the rent, you got to do that super kicks with kids on Saturdays. I mean, that's just the way it is. So mm. I get it. Though, when it comes to the firearms training, tactical training, I feel like there is an aspect of it that is could be very dangerous for some people. So I just wanted to kind of an FYI about 
the shenanigans going on in training schools and with training instructors, just so people are aware of it. So when they choose a school, when they choose an instructor, and when they choose a subject of what they want to learn, they're getting the best bang for their buck for their particular situation. So is the big danger overconfidence in abilities? Oh, that's a huge one. It it is the biggest one. I mean, I'm gonna go over that a little bit, but schools are not around to make you feel bad about yourself or bad about your skills. Uh Otherwise, why would you ever go back? They're based on repeat business. If you come in and they're like, like I tell the students that come in for our MPSD training, you are terrible at shooting. You're lousy. You're an embarrassment to yourself. Fix yourself. Learn how to shoot. Now, I can do that in this situation because it's towards a goal and this is real world. These people will eventually go overseas with us and protect us in the world's most dangerous places. Mm. If I was running a training school, I got to be like, ah, you did great, man. Thumbs (laughs) up. Because I'm thinking about I got I got that house payment. Uh, you know, I got this, I got that. There's a thousand other dudes teaching out there. So I do get that. And I don't really fault them to a certain point. I, I mostly, honestly, I blame the student. I blame the consumer for asking for something that they don't need and basically forcing all these schools and instructors to do these things, even though it's it's completely irrelevant to their, their situation. So, but let's go to instructors since we're talking about instructors. Mm-hmm. All right. So the one you'll see a lot of instructors say I'm former special forces or 20 year SWAT team, or I was a contractor and this and that. That's great. And thank them for their service and protecting our community. It's all those are very, very noble things. But and they, and then they say, I will train you like a Navy SEAL trains, like I did as a Ranger, like I did as a <laughs> SWAT team member. Uh-huh. Well, that's interesting. But I, you're not on a SWAT team. You're not a Navy SEAL. So the particular techniques, I like to kind of compare it to the old Magpul videos, which those techniques are very, very good. They're very uh-huh. fast if you practice them 100,000 times. I mean, if you see the Haley's videos now of him doing it, he's so fast doing those techniques. Oh, yeah. Um, he's practiced a million times. Try doing that right now under stress. It's not going to happen. So the way they train, the way people in the military, basically all they do is train. They train eight, 12 hours a day five or seven days a week. And then when they are training, they're overseas shooting and looting. And then they come back and they all live with each other. They live and train with each other. That's one of the reasons that teams generally live together is to get that in sync. You'll see guys, I like I see when people come for the training here for the MPSD training for HACCP, the first couple of days, everyone's kind of bumbling around. By the fourth day, everyone's in unison, cleaning dishes, working cleaning up their living areas it's like you get this you get in sync with people and it makes it very easy to train but you, that's not what you do you're going to take this weekend class or maybe if you're lucky you can break a week out and take this class and then you know everyone says oh, i'll go home and practice these techniques you're really not going to i mean maybe at the range if you can find a range where you don't have to sit in a square box the whole time or just in time most you take the class and what you learn in that class is what's put in your head so if you're learning Techniques based on team tactics of elite teams, then you're learning the wrong thing. Can they say, hey, I'm going to teach you civilian techniques for defense and things like that? Some schools have gotten away with that. They managed to create a little niche for themselves. Or they're going to say, we will teach you how to shoot like a Delta Force guy. (laughs) Well, which one gets asses and seats, as they say? Yeah. Obviously, the cool guy one. And they'll teach you those techniques. And they're ridiculous for an individual who will never really take that training again, who, um, has a concealed weapon that they probably don't shoot that much when they're around other people, their families, their friends in in a civilian situation. So be weary, not be weary, but be aware of the training that people who are from elite teams give. Because if they say I teach a civilian gunfighting course and then my experience is, you know, all these cool guy things, then that's good. That means the guy's out there. He's trained people. He knows what he's doing. He's experienced situations. But if they're saying, I'm training you like an elite team member, then you really should not go to that course unless you're an elite team member. In my opinion. <laughs> yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah, because you're learning techniques that are very, very difficult. If you, One of my favorite things I base all my training off of is the Sykes-Fairburn, the Get Tough, and a lot of the other uh, books and techniques that were created in World War II. They were brought in to say, hey, we've got four weeks with these soldiers. How do we get them trained? Well, the way we train them is 10 to 15 minute blocks with techniques that are not the best, not the fastest, but they're the ones that you're going to learn under stress. That's what you need to learn, not these crazy 
flipping guns around and things like that techniques, which are cool and they're fast if you got the time to put in and if you have the dedication, you know. Hmm. Don't fool yourself. That's one thing I tell people. Don't fool yourself. Don't think that you're good because I tell you this much. If you do not carry a gun for a living, then you're not good. Hmm. You're mediocre, maybe at best. So learn the techniques for mediocre people. So from instructors who understand that they're teaching someone who uh, repairs copying machines, is a marketing executive, is a housewife or something like that. They need to teach for the situation of the individuals that they're in, not for war. For, yeah. for people who aren't in war. And that makes sense because I know a lot of the, the team tactics stuff that I've been through, you go home and then you're like, even if I wanted to practice it, I can't. You know, because, uh, you know, my my buddy's got a little kid and yeah, we were able to get away for a weekend and do this stuff and it was fun and we had a good time and we acknowledge that. But like being realistic about, yeah, we're not going to get together a couple of days a week or even once a week to do this stuff. So... Yeah, I mean, fun is, I mean, if you're doing it for fun, do it for fun. I've taken yeah. classes for fun. I mean, it's, it's if you're looking to learn a skill or have fun, you got to kind of be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and I'm not trying to say anything bad about these instructors at all. That's why I'm not saying any names really or any co any companies because I understand these guys got to make a living and the consumer forces them to do this. If they say, I'm a former Force Recon Marine and I'm going to teach you how to the most simplest techniques for a civilian to learn in a class that's just all repetition and very little shooting. Well, guess how many people are going to sign up for that class? Mm -hmm. Three, maybe if they're lucky. Now yeah. they do the class. I'm going to teach you how to kick doors like a force recon Marine and dump mags on fools. Well, that, and you can wear full kit. You bet that class will be full. Oh yeah. And we're so, going to fire so, off a thousand rounds a day. Yeah. Into yeah. a hit side of a hill or something. Yeah. You know, don't worry about accuracy, just volume. <laughs> you know, like me when I was dating in my 20s. I don't worry about it. Just bother you. That's all I cared about. <laughs> yeah. Another thing about instructors, and this is very, very controversial, but they must have done what they teach. If they teach gunfighting, they need to have been in a gunfight. If they teach CQB, then they needed to be in CQB in a gunfight. Let me make sure to make it clear. This is referring to more of the tactical skills. The, the You're learning to fight in a gunfight. Whether it's a you walk in on a robbery or it's a home invasion or something, it's a class specifically designed for you to either defend or attack someone, then it needs to be from someone who has done it before in the real world. I know a lot of people say, oh, well, you can learn the techniques and da da da. No, you got to have had that. You got to have that first couple of times where you freeze. You got to have the, the first couple of times where you don't do good, where you recognize mistakes and then you see mistakes of other people. But you, uh, it's like you would never go take a welding class from a guy who's never touched a welder before. Uh, a welder before, so I don't really understand the concept behind why would I take a uh, offensive or defensive tactical firearms class from someone who's never actually had to fire a weapon before. I know not everyone will agree with that. The people I notice who do agree with that are people who've been in shootouts and teach classes, <laughs> and then the ones who don't are the ones who are like uh, NRA five-day instructor mm -hmm. so that's the second thing instructors be aware of what they're teaching make sure that they're teaching a skill based on your situation not uh kicking down the door of bin laden's house and they must have done what they teach at, at some point i believe that is very very important it's an insight you get you get away from that bravado i mean i see it on facebook all the time these guys like oh that guy broke into your car or something you should have smoked him Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like, no, there's nothing in that car. I mean, you can start, you can goat stomp them, but you know, there's no need to take a man's life over things like that. That's the kind of the weird bravado and insecurity that comes from people who have not been there, done that, as they say. Yeah. So, and I guess, and it makes sense. There's, I would imagine, there's a big difference between, uh, not even imagine. I mean, I can just flat out say, without having experienced it, there's a huge difference between actually having had to have taken somebody else's life and talking about it on the internet. Sure. And when it comes to other things, which I'll go over a little bit, you do need those basic training. But I really do believe if you're going to take a tactical, defensive, or offensive training class, it needs to be by someone who's pulled the trigger before. I think that's very important. They have an insight. And they have a respect for life that somebody, it sounds odd that a person who's taken a life would have more respect for life than someone who hasn't but they understand what that decision is. 
more than anyone else. So there's the way they teach, the way they will react if you say something is based on that because it's it's not it's not a joke mm-hmm. to, to kill someone. And you know they have the stress, they have the experience, all these other things they put in that, that helps them be able to become good teachers. But it's it's something I really really stick by. Yeah, no that that actually to me at least that makes perfect sense. And and to give a shitty example, I went deer hunting all of like once. I shot a deer, lots of bravado going into it, walked away from it. I wasn't a mess afterwards, but I said, you know, I just really don't enjoy that. And I sense it whenever somebody says, oh, do you hunt? I'm like, I've just never found myself to be that angry at a deer to feel the need to go hunting. And I don't begrudge anybody who does, but it's, and like I said, I am qualifying this with this is a shitty example, but I I get it. It's like, once you do it, you're like, oh, okay, I don't like that. There, There is a difference. And that's a good mindset to have when you're training other people who will potentially take a life. That's funny you tell me that story because it reminds me of something that happened when I was in Iraq. We had a guy come in on their team. He was a former military. He went to ranger school, but he wasn't a ranger. And he was a good guy, had a lot of experience, but he was in this kind of weird period in the military for a few years where he never deployed anywhere. So he got all this military training as a, like a 18B and never actually went out and did any shooting and looting, but he got in a job on, on a mobile team with, uh, and it was a team that I was on and we got in a, a medium shootout one time and he killed a couple guys during that, came back, helped us break down all the gear, did our AARs, walked into the project manager's office and said, I will be unable to ever take a life again. I resign. So, and this is a guy who was trained to kill. And he just, it's at that point, he decided that this was not actually something that that, that was for him. So it's it's kind of an interesting parallel to your story. There's a reality you see in a situation where you have to take life, human life, and it's a perspective that I think is very unique and needs to be included in the curriculum of someone who teaches, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying I'm not a Superman and, and John Wayne or anything like that by any means. You know, I actually had no business at all being in Iraq when I went there. I got my job in Iraq because uh, people liked me and I told funny stories. But honestly, <laughs> I fired a rifle maybe twice mm-hmm. before I ever went to Iraq. Oh, and wow. they were like, all right, here you are. You're on a road team. I'm like, mm, I might have made a mistake. <laughs> but it's $8,000 a month, which was an insane amount of money to me at the time. I was yeah. like, oh, my God, that's a, a doctor makes $8,000 a month. So uh-huh. to, I, I should have quit. But. It's another example how ego can kind of get away from you where you would do something or teach something that is dangerous because of your ego. And men suffer from this ego issue. It's a big thing. It's a reason for 99% of every problem a dude has. Instructors, another thing that they do, I think we talked about earlier, how go to a class and they pat you on the back and it's good job and da-da-da. And a lot of the people who come to the HACCP MPSD training have been through a lot of training like that. Firearms training is a service-oriented industry. Uh, You have clients who come in and interact with your employees or yourself and have to have a good experience in order to become repeat customers or get back in sales on them. You can't do that when you tell them that they're not good. So instructors do not do either if they're independent or they train with other people or where they, they teach for a company is they do not teach by failure. And that's the way that we learn everything. That's the way we learn language. It's the way we learn walking. It's the way we learn social interacting. It is the way the human mind is made to learn by failing and then correcting. Mm -hmm. But training by failing with firearms means you're not doing a lot of live firearm training. Because if you want to learn, if you're going to get in and out of a vehicle and shoot someone in the back of the head, if you want to learn, if you're going to draw your weapon and shoot yourself in the leg under high stress situations, Generally, the most companies, unless they got a big training budget, they use airsoft. Some use some munitions, which are generally prohibitively expensive. But you, so you don't get to go blast a thousand rounds into a, a target stand or something like that. You don't get to do the cool guy stuff. And when you teach a class, it's like, hey, all right, we're going to go to this two day weekend class where we're going to use airsoft, and I'm going to scream and yell at you, put a hood over your head, and I'm going to pull it off with rock and roll music playing and people running towards you. Well, you know, it sounds neat on paper, but I know as a fact, those classes never, ever fill. Yet they are the best training you can get hands down to be able to learn how to react in situations when your ears don't work. 
an instructor is supposed to take you to a point where you fail. They do it in every elite forces training. And then they find out, okay, this is your failure point. Hey, you are bad at this. Let me fix it. And then find the next failure point. You're bad at this. Let me fix it in front of everyone. Now, if you paid for a course and all you did was told how, how bad you are, and then you improved, and then you failed again, and they said you're bad again, I mean, you're never going to go back to that school. It's going to make you feel bad. You're doing it in front of other people, too. It's embarrassing. Yeah, most people wouldn't enjoy that. Yeah, the instructors have to be brutally honest to be able to develop a student. Because of the consumer, who generally got thin skin, they simply cannot do that and survive and make a living. So because of the consumer, they cannot run classes that do not have tons of live fire, which is silly. It's a bunch of live fire while standing still at a target. It is is I don't even see the point of it. They So they don't use live fire. They um, are very hard on students. They show you your failing points. They In front of everyone, you get to fail and then fix it. That's how you learn. But training tools can't do it. I think there's maybe one or two Maybe one. I mean, I tried to run a class like that. All it did is cost me money. Yeah. No one wanted to go to it, you know, because they want to be able to get on that gear, get on, get on the range, fire a bunch of live ammunition, not pay $500 or $600 to play with airsoft on the, to learn your failure points. Mm-hmm. So go to a class that doesn't have live fire, uses ammunitions or airsoft and will really, really push you. There are a lot of schools that they're not, there are some schools out there that do it. Expect the class to probably 50-50 get canceled because they can't fill up enough student spots. But keep trying. Show these schools, hey, I understand, you know, okay, you had to cancel the class. No big deal. Put me in for the next one. I'll try to get to it. And show these schools, hey, people want these classes because that is where you're going to learn. Learn by failure. Imagine if you were a baby and it's like every time you didn't walk right, your mom was like, oh, it's okay. Just crawl. Well, I mean, you'd be crawling as a grown ass man then. And that's what farm schools do. That speaks to even a generational thing that right now a lot of people piss and moan about millennials. And I think in a large part, that's really what most people agree is the root cause of millennials being, and just to make this quick and easy, like soft, is that they weren't allowed to fail. Yeah. And so, and because of the customer in the firearm industries, instructors have to create a millennial shooting course for grown ass men. (laughs) And I think it's embarrassing. And I'll tell you what, those guys who come to my training at MPSD or HACF, none of them are good. Hmm. None of them. The ones who took all these commercial tactical classes, they are terrible. I put a tiny, tiny little bit of stress in and tell them to do one thing different, they're done. I'm not trying to shame them either. It's so I can show them that they're, they have faults and then they can improve upon it and become very good shooters in the future. So I do this for them so they can protect their family, so they can protect our teams on missions. So there's no ego involved in it for me at all. I have nothing to gain. In fact, all I do is lose my time teaching these classes for for these pre-deployment classes. But the majority of people listening to this, spend three days with me and you will have a life-changing event. Unfortunately, I don't give classes anymore because I can't deal with students because it's one of the main reasons I got out out of the commercial training industry. I will not teach people and just cater to their wants when I know it is not something that that they're going to learn. I think it's unethical. Mm. I was lucky to have some financial means to be able to make that decision. Most people don't, especially people coming from my background or military law enforcement. So I'm a little bit on a high horse for that because I was able to have an option to say, hey, I'm not going to. Otherwise, if I didn't, I would be like, all right, let's put on that tactical gear and start blasting holes in the size of hills because I got rent to pay. Mm. And I get that. But That was one of the main reasons that I stopped teaching. I teach an occasional fun course, like a PKM class, which is just, it's fun. I mean, most of the people aren't going to go shoot a PKM out of a car. You know, it's a fun course. Take fun courses. That's fine. Do not take a fun course thinking that you're going to learn something that is practical to you because you will not fail. The other thing about failure is it takes a lot of instructors. It's dangerous and it's not cool. Yeah. So nobody wants to take it. And while we're on the subject of things that you make your instructor do, I have a couple things I call stupid things you make instructors teach because you're a dumb. (laughs) (laughs) I want to see how many of these I get. But first, let's take a break for this quick message. Listeners, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? We'd love to give you more. Visit ITRH.net to find out about membership benefits. 
For starters, members get access to every episode ever produced and a monthly virtual conference. That's just for starters. And it's important to know, In the Rabbit Hole is supported nearly entirely by roving horde armada members just like you. That's how we pay the bills, stay on the air, keep the lights on around here. So go to iturh.net to learn how you can become part of the ITRH Roving Horde Armada. Next up, subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast app to make sure you never miss an episode by going to intherabbithole.com slash iTunes or intherabbithole.com slash Stitcher or intherabbithole.com slash iHeartRadio or intherabbithole.com slash Google Play or if you are one of those weirdos who listen to the show through YouTube, you can go to intherabbithole.com slash YouTube because you know what? We support weirdos. However weird you want to be, we're all about that. Now, back to the show. Yeah, um, in classes, one of the things I see is they teach advancing, which is there's a target that you need to eliminate or shoot at. So you walk towards it and fire your gun. That is the most ridiculous thing in the world. That has come from SWAT and military CQB, where you got like 12 other dudes who are tuned in. And then uh, you can drop a drone bomb on the house later if you want. By walking, you have a 10 foot difference. So one in a thousand bullets will cause a lethal wound on your body, statistic, mathematically, plus or minus a little bit. You mean so like 10 feet? Yeah. So you will get, you may get shot, but you won't die. Okay. I'm talking of a lethal wound from a bullet. Theoretically, you could get shot at a thousand times. The only one will kill you, though. Obviously, that would be a big magazine for a bad guy to have. But <laughs> yeah. at 20 feet, now you're talking about one in 10,000 of those bullets. Will, statistical level will create it, will kill you. Mm. Go back another 10 feet, it's one in 100,000. And you go back a little more, it's in, in millions. So what you want to do is not reduce the mathematical probability that you will be killed. What's the best way to reduce the mathematical probability that you will not get killed and increase the probability you will get killed? Walk closer towards someone who is not trained with a firearm like you are and to give them a target that's closer to them. Mm. It is, in my opinion, the most ridiculous and irresponsible thing to be, that you should teach civilians. Why are you advancing on this target? If you are a decent shot, you should be able to shoot a target at 25 meters without even sights. That's a whole other subject. But... You want to put space between you and someone else. That means going left or going right. Now, if you go to the range, I'll put put a little bit of stress on you and then have you shoot at a moving target at 15 meters. You will probably not even hit the target. I know everyone's thinking, oh, I'll get it. I'll get it. Mm, not after me. Not <laughs> when I'm putting the stress on you. Mm-hmm. And the stress I put you on is 1% of what you will actually feel when you go straight to red or black. So the bad guy, they're stress inoculated. They're not like you. They grew up sleeping on the floor of their bedroom because there's uh, drive-bys outside as a kid. They grew up having to constantly watch your back for violence that would kill them. They have stress inoculation that you do not have. You grew up in a nice neighborhood or even an okay neighborhood. But I doubt there's many times in your life as a child that during the day you had to worry about being murdered at least 20 or 30 times. So they have stress inoculation. You do not. What you have is skill. And that skill is range. You can hit a target farther out than they can. So you want to put range and movement onto a guy that's shooting at you. And you reduce the probability that they will not hit you. You do not want to close in directly, squared up with somebody. Because you're going to get shot and killed. 100%. You know, that's interesting. And I can actually only think of one course I've ever taken where we were treated. Treating and returning fire. There's a bunch of courses I took that were not necessarily intended for civilians and those I understood. But, you know, it's it's interesting. I think when you put it in that perspective of real hard numbers and statistics of, hey, you know, you keep backing up and you're greatly increasing your chances of survival. That's a much better selling point than, you know, advance into this for into this fight for no particular reason. Yeah. And you're decreasing the chances of their survival. Mm -hmm. Their ability to continue. Fire is cover. Accurate fire is ending the situation. So you're able to give yourself space. But the reason that instructors teach this, students want it. It's cool. It's SWAT team shit, man. And it allows you to have a very large group of students be able to move and shoot. 
with very few instructors and range safety officers. You're all walking at the same pace. Nobody's above the, the moving firing line. And there's no walking backwards, which you're more likely to trip. If you move sideways, left or right, then it's only one person on the whole firing line at a time. That, that means you have to have less students also. So it's a cool way for people to think that they're moving around and doing cool stuff. And I'm, you know, I saw it in a movie and I saw it on 24 where you advance on a guy and smoke them. <laughs> but no, you're going to get killed doing that. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous. I hate that any instructors teach it. I always teach even to MPSD guys who are going overseas, everything. If you are firing your gun, you are running away. Period. Mm, that's good. That's what you're doing. One hundred percent of the time. If you ever stand still and shoot, you're going to get killed. But you pull out your weapon, you're firing. You are going either to the left, the right, or to, or behind you. No, I happens. was I was pointing out that there was only one class I ever took where they did teach retreating, and I'm going to call myself out on this. Even playing with my cert laser pistol in the house. I have a tendency, not even a have a tendency, I'm just going to full on admit it. I do advancing drills in the house and I have never practiced retreating drills. And so, that, I mean, that's a huge point because so much of the classes I've taken and everything else, and because it's cool, uh, have been around advancing, which is something, yeah, you make a great point. And there. it's a hard sell. I would love to do a class just called Runaway. <laughs> one on one. I mean, because that's what you need to do. The other thing is, why if you're advancing, you're in public. Most people are with someone else, a family yeah. member, a loved one, their child. You really, you're going to leave your kid. Mm. And the other thing is, in a home, you're going to advance away from the bedroom with your wife or or child. Maybe they're not armed. Maybe they are armed. And the chances of them accidentally shooting you when you come back through the bedroom door are pretty high. Mm. You need to learn how to peel. You always go back. Always go back. That's what you need to have to learn. And, uh, and going back on oh, the last subject, you are not good at shooting under stress. I know you're not good. So do not add in. Let me increase the chances that this bad guy who has better stress inoculation than I do, let me give him a larger, bigger target to shoot at. At the same time, I am not that really that good at shooting under stress. Mm -hmm. So you, you just give them these, these opportunities, advantages, advantages, mathematical advantages over people who sh you should beat in a gunfight with even a minor amount of training. We see the second stupid thing that you make instructors do teach, transitions, going from a rifle to a pistol. I hate every time I see someone do that, I want to <laughs> hit them over the head with a frying pan. I was like, you will be in a situation where you have an open carry style holster, no jacket over it, a slung weapon, and then you're going to fire out 30 rounds. Well, and of course, they always teach this drill advancing again. <laughs> so while you're advancing, somehow you manage to blow out all 30 rounds and not end the situation. And it's you're in such a hurry. You then have to pull, you have to flip your weapon over to the side and then go for your pistol and then uh, a dump mag dump another 17 rounds. That's ludicrous because you will not have all those weapons with you. You will not have all the gear with you in a, in a big shootout. I can't even there may be some examples where a civilian was wearing full kit and got into a shootout with a bad guy that was not law enforcement, bounty hunter, or anything else related. I have never heard of it. Every time I hear of it, it's a guy in his bathrobe, a pharmacist, lady in the parking lot, pulling a gun from her purse. That's what I see. You're learning another silly skill that looks very cool. It's neat. Mm. And that skill was specifically created for elite military teams and SWAT teams because, by law, their job is to apprehend dangerous felons at any cost so they're retreating i think now some departments are starting to do retreating instead of getting a big shootout in the house but generally speaking especially with the elite military teams you're going in there to kill people you're going in there to zap dudes and and take names so retreating is not an option but for some reason that this transition thing has gotten into the civilian market and every time i see a video online i'm like I don't yell at the instructor because he knows if the instructor, especially if the instructor is ex-military and has, pulled, has some trigger time, they know a hundred percent it's bullshit, mm. but that's what the consumer says. They said, let me learn transitions. It's cool. I'm going to advance on somebody in my house so that they 100% will shoot me in the head. It's, it's I, I don't get it. Do not make your instructors teach you these things. Do not go to classes where you advance, where you do transitions, <laughs> make all those classes disappear from the tactical firearms market. Unless you're on a SWAT team or you're military 
or you want to do it for fun. Okay. All right. As long as it's in your mind that I'm doing this class because it's cool and I get it. I like take, doing cool things. We do fun training all the time just for the heck of it. But do not go in with the mindset that I'm learning the skill that I will be able to defend myself and my family with. You are learning the skill that will get you and your family killed. But if you if you got a free weekend and you're like, man, I just want to have some fun with my buddies and advance and kick down doors, go for it. Have fun. Just remember that what you were learning. So what I'm mo- mostly today talking about is for people who want to learn how to defend themselves and how to defend their families. So I don't want to keep going back and forth saying, unless you're just doing it for fun, yeah. this is not for the fun stuff. If you want to do fun stuff, I'll do an episode where I'll tell you the coolest classes to take where you get to do the neatest stuff because those schools, nobody's even heard of them, but you're doing like shooting out of a helicopter for 500 bucks for two days. So I can do a class about that. There we, we, we have we have an episode for next season already, <laughs> yeah. lined up and ready yeah. to go. But anyway, yeah, no one knows of all the really cool schools that do stuff because it's usually a rich guy who owns a bunch of land whose brother was like a ranger, and they just teach whenever. Yeah, but they do crazy, crazy cool stuff. So don't, don't go to some dumb class where you're firing a bunch of rounds to the side of a hill. Go to if you want to go to a cool class, go to a cool class. Yeah, you know. Go to class like, I don't know, there's a one where you get to shoot a PKM out of the back <laughs> of a Hyundai while doing donuts and bays. That's pretty fun. Cheap. All right. That's enough for instructors. Schools. Schools. Oh, I got a lot of issues with schools. Schools. As soon as you add that office building, the secretary, the insurance, the accountant, then you got to start putting seats and asses. So that's when all the practical skills just get thrown into the garbage can. One thing in most schools, everything is standing still or standing in a row with other students. There's one thing that I noticed in Iraq over the transition of when I went there, when the war just started to the day that we withdrew all the troops. The bad guys stopped standing when they're shooting. They finally figured out if we stand still, we're going to get killed. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. But... Why do schools have to have guys standing still at the range shooting for a a defensive or offensive firearms class? Why do they have to be all in the same lane, all in the same firing lane at the same time? It's simple. It's cheaper. You get to have you have less range safety officers and less instructors. I can teach 30 people with three people if everyone's on the same lane. It's Mm. pushing it. But I can do that if we're moving. Around, like left, right, forward, front, right, one person on the range, at least two other range secure safety officers with me. Three to one at that point. Oh, wow. And it eats up time. Yeah. So you got an eight-hour class in a day. And I, honestly, most people don't have the fitness to even get through the eight hours without being winded at the end. So you got an eight-hour class. You know, each student's maybe getting an hour or hour-ish of actual running around shooting training. So you got to make the class small, five, six people max. Then you can get a few couple hours in for everyone to shoot and watch people shoot. So you got six people with at least one head instructor, assistant instructor, and two range safety officers that you're all paying salaries to and paying for the range and all these other things. You can't make any money out of it. Mm. So I get that schools can't do it. But there's something I've learned in my older age is to buy once, you know, save your money and buy once. I want a blender. We were talking about blenders before the show started. Yeah. You know, some people think I, I would be insane to buy an $800 blender. I guarantee I will have that blender 20 years from now. I guarantee it. That blender you will, yeah. Yeah, and it's it goes with any other things. Why are you looking for budget firearms training, defensive or offensive firearms training to protect yourself and your family? Why do you want to get the absolute cheapest class? Spend $800, spend $1,200, get those small classes with really good instructors. That's what you need to do. Do not take these classes with 40, 50 people in it. You're not going to learn anything. You don't get any one-on-one. You don't get to move left and right. You don't get to have the range to yourself. Any decent class, uh, we'll name one name, uh, Travis Haley. He keeps small classes and a lot of one-on-one time and a lot of moving around. So it's instructors like that. But you're looking at $800 for a one-day class. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Something of quality is expensive. Having six people max in a class that, that an instructor has to fly to Oklahoma to teach, get a hotel room, fly his assistant instructors into, rent a range, it's going to be expensive. Or he can do 30 people and make the exact same amount of money, but you don't learn anything. 
or he does six or eight and you get a lot of one-on-one time, a lot of really good training. So spend the money and get a really, really good training. And guess what? It, this is one of the few times where something's more expensive, it's better. The more expensive an instructor is, generally the more the better he is. So if some guy's charging $1,200 a day, he's going to have three, three, six people max in that class, two range security safety officers, a medic, and you're going to get a lot of one-on-one time, a lot of time moving around. Because if you're moving, there's only one student shooting at a time. You know, you bring up a big point, and this is something I've been trying to figure out lately is the mentality there. Because people, whether they realize it or not, even if they buy $800 or a $1,000 AR or up, but then they won't spend that same amount of money on a class. They're like, well, you know, I spent all my money. And it's like, well, then they go and they don't even realize that they'll go dump another $1,500 into that AR on optics, on accessories and doodads and kit and stuff like that. And it's like, and and, and I'm not harsh anybody. I, I get that it happens, but I, I'm in the same boat. I've been trying to figure out, I guess for the last six months, this has been on my mind. Like, why do people do this? So that makes because sense. Because it's cool. And that's a good point. If your kit and your gun combined is it costs more than the class you're taking, then you're not paying enough for that class. An expert, somebody who is worth your time. I mean, if if I wanted to have, I don't know if he's even Bob Seeger come play at warehouse here for the guys. Guess what? It's going to cost a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But if I want to have the local musician in town come, it's almost free. You yeah. see, you get a little bit of promotion from it. Who do you want? The guy whose time is valuable or the top person whose time is not valuable? Mm -hmm. If their time is valuable, there's a reason. No one will pay a lot of money for someone who is not good. Anyone who is good gets paid to be good. There's there's always a joke about like uh, medics and contracting. I can never find any good PSD or contract medics to come out with us on missions. You know why? Because they're all working. They're all good. Uh If you're good, you're working and you're getting paid top dollar to do it. If you're the best accountant in the world, you're getting a lot of money. If you're the best copywriter, if you're one of the best copywriters, you're making tens of thousands of dollars a letter, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. You want to pay somebody who is good is expensive. Yeah. So what are some of these other things that that these schools end up doing that, that people should watch out for? Some BS marketing, there's some shenanigans and marketing going on in a lot of these schools. No, there's never shenanigans in marketing, oh, James. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> um, a lot of people want to get into civilian contracting, security contracting in particular. Mm-hmm. So a lot of schools are catering towards that, PSD operator course, PSD medic, and all these other things. Then And they say 50% of our students go on to PSD jobs overseas or EP jobs domestically. Well, the thing they don't tell you is they've already been working as in PSD overseas or EP in the States for 10 years already. And then they took a little time off, took their class, or maybe we're giving their class for free. A lot of guys in the industry get free classes so they can go through it. And then as soon as they go back, they go back on the contract that they're still on. They were, they were not fired. They just were on a 30 day leave. Mm. And then they go back and they're like, well, Look at that, man. Three guys from the last class. They went on to a PSD job in Afghanistan. It's like, no, dude, they went back to work. <laughs> you know, they did not take your class and then get employed. I'll tell you all, I, I talked to a guy today about it. If you want to get in on overseas security contracting, you will not. It's done. The market is is gone. You're not going to get in unless you're a tier one guy, which is like former SEAL, Delta, Force Recon, people like that. Unless you're that, you will not get in. The market's done. There's... 10 to 20,000 people who have over eight years of experience and military backgrounds that worked in Iraq during the boom and Afghanistan during the security contracting boom, they are all working at Home Depot now and wanting to get on a job. The amount of jobs that exist is 1% of what existed then. So you have 100 times the amount of people all trying to get a very tiny amount of jobs. Guess who gets those jobs? The guys who have the most experience. And the guys who didn't cause any problems when they were on contracts. I know guys with very good resumes, top shelf resumes, trying to find work. Hey, man, James, you heard anything? The force protection contracts that everyone used to get on easy, guys are battling to get on a $12 an hour uh, force protection contract in Afghanistan. You will not get on. So to go down that rabbit hole, because I'm curious, why is that? Like, is the market just flooded and we're not, because uh, it seems like yeah. I mean, we're just starting trouble everywhere. So I, I, would... well, it's, uh, I, I equate 
the security contractor boom to the dot com boom. It was this wild west where anyone and their mother could open up a business and get a contract and everyone wanted PSD. And so then the government was like, hey, this really works. We can have less soldiers. And if the contractors get killed, we don't have to account for it. Mm. So there were, I forgot how many, it was like almost at one point, it was one to one contractors in Iraq. Now, not all of them were security contracts. The majority of them were base operations. But the market, like anything else, bottoms out. There's a boom, then a bust, and there's a big contractor, uh, security contractor job bust, and then the market worked itself out. Mm, Who gets to stay in? The professionals, the guys who know how to use a computer, the guys who get along with people, the guys who have real skills and have continuing education. And the other thing is road teams just don't exist. I did road work in Iraq. Um, There were 100 teams on the road at any time. Now there aren't. Nobody does road work. Why? Because government's like, no more of this nonsense of guys posting videos with rock and roll music while they're shooting at civilian cars. No more of this Yahoo stuff. The government Mm. has basically said, if there are any road teams, we're going to have seasoned professionals. Occasionally, a video of a road team in Iraq or Afghanistan will come up on YouTube where they get into a shootout, every guy is in their mid to late 40s or early 50s. They're only <laughs> taking seasoned guys who are like, I do not want to get in a shootout. Mm-hmm. I want to plan the mission well. And if we are, we'll withdraw. We'll be smart. I'm not going to shoot up a civilian car because girls didn't talk to me in high school. It's none of that <laughs> nonsense going on. Uh-huh. So, yeah. so, I mean, that makes so sense. that's the way it is. What basically exists now is varying levels of force protection. Mm-hmm. They want people with in-country experience. The last job I saw was... $250 a day for Afghanistan, which is, mm. I mean, I can make that in the States. I don't know, giving ZJs underneath a bridge or something, man. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wow. So have fun. You're not going to get on it. And so don't get fooled. Don't say, oh, well, you know, we are a PSD course. It's a two week residential course. It's only $5,300. They are lying to you and they're scamming to you. That's the only, that's one of the only groups here. I will blame the company and the instructors. Well, I don't blame the instructors. They got to make a living, even though it's eh. But you're 100% lying. You're full of shit. They're stealing your money. They are unethical. So there's one last little thing I like to touch off on before I go. Females. Females getting training. Females. I've never really trained females before until recently. If you look at every single tactical school or instructor's page, the chances of you finding a woman in any of the pictures are pretty much zero. Uh It's just not really a thing that women do. Now, some do. They're smart and they know they want to learn how to defend themselves. Generally, they don't really take these classes. But recently, with our MPSD teams for HACCP, I need women doing PSD for many reasons. You know, especially in the cultures in the Middle East, why we need female and PSD team members. So recently I have been going to every single every single subject matter expert I know that has trained females. Most of them are European or Israeli, uh, some here in the States for law enforcement. I was almost shocked at the differences, but this is something schools will not tell you. Women should not be in classes with men and they should receive a completely different type of training for whatever subject you want to learn. Oh, OK, that's. It's hard for some women to hear because they're like, oh, I'm, you know, girl power and we're the same, blah, blah. No, you're not. And I say that with no malice or, or, or misogyny at all. I'm saying it as a professional in this field with 20 plus years of experience. Women need to be trained differently. They need to not be trained with men. I'll tell you a couple of reasons. One, men are very good at saying, hey, man, this is what you need to do. Boom, boom, boom. OK, now you're improving. With women, because I would argue that they're smarter than us and they at least they think about things. Mm -hmm. Dudes are very good at being like, shut up and do it. You Mm -hmm. know, but women are are like, hey, why? Which I'm sure every single man here knows that. (laughs) And it's getting a visceral reaction from hearing that. But they want to know why. And some instructors or school would just say, well, I'm not going to pander to this. No, it's not pandering. It's teaching a different demographic how to shoot. I teach civilians differently than I teach guys going on missions differently than I teach military different than I teach law enforcement. Every group is different and women are obviously different. So in the instruction, they need to be, there needs to be more explanation. They don't say, Hey, adjust your stance. No, you need to say adjust your stance because when you fire this way, it causes your body to be off balance. And it also, you're not squared up at the target. So you'll have to turn your body, which thereby changes the mechanics of your the muscles in your arms 
causing you to pull the trigger differently that makes you inaccurate. I'll show you shoot it that way, and then I'll adjust you, and you shoot it the other way. When I do that with female students, boom, they learn immediately. If I'm just like, hey, shoot this way. Hey, this is the way we're supposed to shoot. They don't learn, and they go back to their old habits because they need to be explained. I wish more male students were like that. I wish they would ask me, hey, why is why do we do it this way? Because I think it's important to know the reasoning behind it. Another thing that's a hard pill to swallow for ladies Women are not physically equal to men in most cases. Now, there there are exceptions to that. There are women who do CrossFit that look a little gross, but they're very, very <laughs> strong and have six packs and stuff. And I'm sure are much physically stronger than me. Guess what? Your center of balance is different than a man. Mm. It, it is. Your feet and hand size are different. Feet size is important. That's your balance. You ever try to balance, you can balance something. If it's got a big leg on it, then it's going to balance easily. If it's small, it won't. It's that simple. Balance is everything to, to when it comes to the combat arts. Women have smaller feet. They have smaller hands. Their muscles are simply different than the male. Their skeletal structures are different than men. So they need to be trained a different way than men, men do because it is a scientific fact that women are physically different than us bone structure. Muscle structure, muscle mass, center of gravity, and even um, their equilibriums can be different than men. See, and that actually makes perfect sense, even if you just look at it from a standpoint of even amongst men, different people will cotton to and do better or worse with different martial arts based on that martial arts focus. So like judo, jujitsu, things like that. Those sorts of things are good for people with lower center of gravities. They're shorter. Maybe they're they're more just square-shaped human beings or whatever versus taekwondo or anything like that. That's good for people that have good long legs and can reach out to things. So that actually makes, I mean, it makes perfect sense, even if you're pitting men against men or or whatever, and it's going to be the same yeah, thing. Yeah, and it's like myself. I mean, there's a lot of good martial arts out there, a lot of Krav Maga, there's all these other things. I chose to do boxing. Why? Because I'm not big and I'm not tall, probably below average on both of those. So I looked into it and I said, what ends the fight fastest? Just like a gunfight, you get mm. five pops in some guy's nose and you know how to jab, which most people's weak hand is just worthless. I can get hit by a guy's weak hand all day long. So I learned how to end a fight fast. All I learned was boxing. And then later I learned some some ground stuff because a lot of good do, do bro guys like to go to the ground. But they're not used to the way I fight. I'll bite somebody. <laughs> you know, like the Muay Thai, if you're tall and big, you will snap some guy in half with Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. If I hit a guy with a Muay Thai strike at my height and weight, who's like 6'3 and like 320, I will not really do any damage to him. I, I'll make him mad. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you can. No, no, no. It's, it's nonsense. But what I can do is I can punch him in the nose 16 times before he even gets that first hit off. Then I can run away. So, or get a chair or something. So I learned it's the same thing. So I understand my, my, as being a shorter, smaller dude, I understand what I need to do to learn how to fight. Women have to understand that it is very, very different for them to learn how to fight. The other thing is situations women get put into. I, I remember I was friends with this female police officer. She was physically large, broad shoulders, definitely owned a lot of flannel and drove a Subaru Outback. 100%. <laughs> she said that Every single time she's alone, it doesn't matter how tall, how big a guy he is. He can be six five, or he can be four foot nine. Every single time they want to fight her. Why? Because they just in the man, especially in the macho cultures that come from the criminal of people who are most likely to be involved in criminal activity. Women are always considered weaker. Just this thing that they get into their mind. There's a lot more machismo in those societies than there are are in you know white middle class suburbia. You know, it's not really caring about if you're a tough guy, it's if you're a good provider. In a lot of areas where that people grow up in violent, it's are you a tough guy? Or are you a big guy? And so from their whole life, they look at women as lesser physically capable than they are, even if they are not. Because I tell you what, this broad, she could knock out anyone anytime she wanted. She was strong. She power lifted. But every single time she got she was alone, would get in a physical altercation with a guy and have to smash him. Now, she was telling me about other cops she worked with that were like five foot six and weighed like 130 pounds. Maybe 10 percent of the, the amount of time they would get into a physical altercation with someone because to the bad guy, it's still a man. Mm. This is just real world stuff. So you need to teach women need to be taught in the situation that they will have to escalate their defense of themselves much, much faster than men. Hmm. The, and then to combine that bad guy doesn't see a woman as a threat. 
they will up their violence faster and then go back to the other part. Then they need women need to know how to defend themselves in a different way, a different manner to be able to, to react to that violence faster. There used to be a pyramid that cops used. It was like a verbal, then baton, then da da da. Mm. And they had that option a lot of times for women. It's verbal and then to the gut. It's just the way it's got to be. Because as I mentioned before, women just physically are built different than most men. And if a dude who weighs 170 pounds jumps on top of a woman who weighs 110 or 120 pounds, he will beat her up. I mean, even if she's very good at martial arts, that guy's been in 50 fights. He grew up in the worst part of town. He knows how to fight. So he will get you. So for men, sometimes that's an option to get physical one-on-one with another person before they would kill someone. For a woman, it is not. If a guy is, is advancing on you, then you need to kill him because they will kill you. They will rape you. But schools tend to teach the same level of escalation of violence to every student because can't have that separate. La- I have had female instructors and female friends say, don't you dare do a separate ladies class because it will be some people will find that to be extremely insulting. Hmm. You know? Yeah, they were like, don't do it. Don't do it. It'll, it'll make you look bad. But this is the reality of the situation. A man wishing violence upon a woman will advance on her much faster than a dude. Once they're physically engaged to them, they will win a a, a physical altercation, and then the woman will get raped, murdered, or kidnapped. That's it. Mm. So unlike a man like myself, I'm not the biggest dude, but I can handle myself. I can go to the ground if I have to. And if it's between taking a life of some drunk dude and just getting on the ground with him and and having to punch him in the face with my head or something, that's fine. For a woman, mm, you don't know what's going to happen. Women are be not being trained correctly because it is politically incorrect. Slash, this, I blame the student again. I, I, I'm gonna take a class with the guys. Why should I be any different? Well, mm-hmm. you are different. So wake up to the real world, or you're gonna get killed, or raped, or hurt. So women should be taught in women's only classes that are specifically catered, not teaching the same bullshit. Specifically catered to female students. That's what needs to be done. Schools won't do it. They won't do it. I think there's I, there's one school we were recently talking about that does do it. Mm-hmm. And I'm very and she was on your podcast. I, I forgot her name. Gina, yeah, Gina. Gina yeah, yeah. She. I listen to podcast. Sounds like an excellent instructor. She's got a good head on her shoulders, and she under she teaches female only classes. Mm-hmm. So I applaud instructors that do that. So what's the send off message here? Send off message is I'm gonna give some some folks some tips on how they should train if they really want to become good at defending themselves and their family. First off, put that gun in a box. You're not going to need it for the first cl- couple classes because if you go to the gun, you failed already. There's a thing in, in executive protection and uh, EP work and PSD work. It is, there are basically, there's six phases of a terrorist operation or an assassin's operation. It's everything from planning to surveillance to blah, blah, blah. If you block one or all of those things, the chances of you being attacked, assassinated, or hurt goes to basically zero. There's a guy in the industry, he's a legend, his name is Frank Gallagher. One of his claims to fame that he proudly says is, I did X thousand missions, or hundreds, of, I think it's six or 700 missions in Iraq during like 04 to 06, which was the hottest time. I never pulled the trigger on my gun once. Why? Because he was so good, he, he planned, he was aware, his people that were working with him was good. You fail when you have to shoot. There's always a way to, to avoid the situation outside of a black swan event. There's no reason to ever use your firearm. So it's great to have those hard skills, soft skills, or how you defend yourself and your family. Those are what you need. If you, as on a daily basis, when you plan to do things, when you go out with your family, when you close your door at night, if you know these very, very simple soft skills that will not interfere with your life, the chances that you are a victim of crime outside of a black swan event are basically zero as proven by someone who did hundreds of missions, 05 to 07, running missions, high profile State Department PSD missions in Iraq and never pulling the trigger once. That is godlike, but that's how good he was. He planned out everything. He denied the enemy every opportunity to inflict violence upon them. And if you learn those skills, you can do the exact same thing. So the first thing, if you want to be really, really good at defending yourself and your family, You need to take a class on situational awareness and basic security knowledge. The best thing to do is to take an executive protection course. Avoid ones that have more than one day of shooting. That's another thing. All EP schools, 
They have to put in shooting, even though there's never been one recorded instance of a licensed bodyguard ever shooting anyone in America ever. But they have to do it because of marketing. I get it. But try to find a school that only has like a one day thing. A lot of states, a lot of schools will teach them in the evenings for guys who want to get into EP work. Take that class. It's great. That is the every single person that comes to work with HACCP or who will want advice. I say, take this class. This is the basis of building all of your skills off of. You will learn how to uh, recognize danger. You will learn how to plan around it. You will learn how what situational awareness is, and you will learn how to do all of that while you are with people who are untrained. That is the big thing. The chances of you being with a fire team of buddies when you're out with your family going to a movie is zero. You're going to be alone. You're going to be with your family. So let's base your situational awareness and your defensive awareness skills off of that. So take an executive protection class. Leave your gun at home except for that one day. You know what? Don't even show up on the day that they shoot. It's, it's, it's worthless. There's no need to even do it. So I just saved you a day off of the class. Just tell the instructor, I want to do this to protect myself and my family. I'm not interested in shooting. Now you just saved a bunch of money on range fees and ammunition. But you get the skills that you need. The second is get basic marksmanship training. Now, there's one of the best groups is Appleseed. It's, it's, it's such a tiny amount of It's like a, the mouth for a lunch. And you get two days of training over a weekend and just how to pull the trigger without moving the gun, which nobody seems to be able to do. No one, <laughs> it's, it's a lost skill. Mm-hmm. How to shoot accurately. And in some cases, shoot accurately and fast. But learn how to shoot accurately. It does no good if you can fire your gun a thousand rounds a minute or four rounds a minute and not hit anything. You need to have these basic marksmanship skills. So go back. I don't care how many tactical classes you take. Go back, take a very basic marksmanship class. And like I said, the reason I suggest Appleseed is it's cheap. They don't have those dude bro guy instructors who are tough guys. They just have older dudes who just want to teach people how to shoot accurately. So that's the second class. Next, if you get into a shootout, it's going to be with a handgun. That's it. You will never get into a shootout as a civilian with a rifle. If you have lesser means, maybe, you you know, you don't make a ton of bucks or you got a family, you got a pistol and like two AR-15s, sell those AR-15s, get some ammo, go to the best instructor you can go to and train. And you know what? Every quarter, go to at least a two-day class every quarter. Keep those skills in, go to the range every month, minimum. You need stress inoculation training. There are a lot of good ones out there. The ones we mentioned before where they use the hood training, which is one of the big things that we do around here. Any like force on force, force on force with airsoft is better because it's cheaper. It's going to save you a lot of money. Do these classes where you're doing force on force, get that stress inoculation. Then you will see yourself fail and fail and fail. But you'll have an op- you'll get an opportunity that you won't get if you fail when it comes down to it. You get to restart, put some more BBs in your gun, and then get it in. You, you need to have that stress inoculation. The first time to do something should not be the time you need it. So do it a hundred times. Pulling your gun out under stress, having a guy just suddenly run up into you and tackle you, all these other things. Having to uh, suddenly be in a room, the lights are on, you don't know what the room is, and you and you got to start washing out. You, you need to be able to do that. Otherwise, you go straight to panic, you go straight to red or black, and you're no good. Do it a 50, 60 times, then you're going to be a little bit better. Do it 100 times, 1,000 times, then you're going to be good. You need to understand how you react when you're under stress, when you get that tunnel vision. You're going to get tunnel vision, too. The last one is, I keep saying it on almost every podcast, take a verbal judo class, read the book, learn how to be aggressive when you speak, because you can stop a lot of situations with that simply by having some confidence and not looking like a victim. Just do that in general, because every I'm tired of hearing these dudes who are like, hey, man, how's it going? I'm, I'm doing pretty good. No, don't, you got to talk to me like a man, dude. It, it's killing me. <laughs> so just take that to not annoy me and it will actually help you if you ever come into a situation because if you're going hey man uh, b- uh, back off uh, no if you're yelling at a dude get to, get away from me stand away stand away or defend myself and also it gets you into a thing where you don't escalate it teaches you de-escalation if you get this black swan event and you're getting cornered you want to de-escalate 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 to either give yourself an advantage because it's putting them off a little bit off balance or to just make the situation leave, or to create a hole for you to escape. And the last piece of advice I'm going to give everyone is run away. Second anything <laughs> looks wrong, just run away. That's it. You'll yeah, live. That's a good one. Majority of the time. So that's it, man. I, I think some people are going to be angry at me in the industry after this, but 
I don't really care. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these are things that have been bothering me, especially the stuff with the ladies, because these schools and these instructors who don't understand and the students, the female students, it's really your fault. Cannot train like a man. You have to train like a woman. It's that simple. We don't think you're less. As far as uh, marksmanship is, women are superior. Their bodies, oh yeah, all their day, skeletal every day. structure is built in a way that they are superior shooters. Mm. So that's one of the biggest messages because, especially, I've been working, you know, in Iraq and these places where these women are just being victimized. And then my friend Stephen Dana, who runs a group called Protection from Abuse, who provides free security surveys and, and bodyguards, executive protection to women who are in domestic violence situations. If women had some training and were able to defend themselves and carried a weapon and knew how to react based on their situation and their physical capabilities and their perception from the bad guys, there would be a lot less victims out there. So I really wish women would seek out other female instructors who are qualified. The lady we spoke of before, her classes look excellent. I know people have taken them. So I would definitely suggest if I believe it's in the Houston area, yeah. if you're a lady listening, I would say go to this class. Do not go to my classes. Do not go to anyone else's classes. Learn from a female who knows how to teach females. The rest of the stuff is just shenanigans. And if you want to have fun, go out and have fun. But if you want to learn how to fight, if you want to learn how to defend yourself, take the advice I gave you very, very seriously because it's good. I keep, I've said before in this podcast, most of my life up to this point has been a train wreck. Relationships, train wreck, credit record, train wreck, relationship with my family, train wreck. I am great at this, teaching, running missions as a critical thinker in this field. I am very good. I'm really, really good. Everything else I'm lousy at, but so (laughs) heed my advice. Don't take financial advice or relationship advice from me, but take this advice because this is what I know. This is the one thing I'm good at. Awesome, dude. So we talk about Hassif. How do people connect with you and keep up with the good work that you're doing over at Hassif? The Hassif website, which is dvmhasf.org. It's dvmhasf.org. Also, we're on Facebook and a bunch of other places. And I'm going to be guest teaching a few times this year. So, But I usually put that stuff up on my personal Facebook, which you can find a link to on the Hassif website, and you'll be able to find me. You can't add me because I'm way over the friend limit, but I have like a fan page, which is Seems extremely narcissistic to have, but our marketing guy <laughs> insisted that I did, so uh, I have that. But I, I put updates and stuff there. So I want to get back to training some civilians just for some fun this year, but I want to teach practical stuff. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> anyway, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm going on a lot of missions, doing a lot of stuff with Hassett and uh, Good day, but, uh, man. I appreciate being back on, man. It's fun. And I, this is stuff I really want to get off my chest. Yeah. But I knew I couldn't do if I'm still a civilian commercial instructor. Mm. So your listeners are definitely getting a look behind the curtain. (laughs) Make Some people really hate me, which is fine. I like being one of the most hated people on the internet. It brings tons of free traffic to all of my sites. (laughs) I make so much money. It's awesome. It's like the best (laughs) free stuff that I I have ever got because they would never buy anything from me or donate to Asif. Their friends would never, but because they comment on it and it shares, then it starts going into that mark that you usually got to pay a lot for on Facebook, which is the friends of friends. Mm -hmm. And that's the sweet spot. So I wish to thank all my haters for making me so successful. They've been quiet lately. It's been a little annoying. But uh, so I had to actually pay for Facebook ads lately, which is painful. But, you know, it's all good. Here we are stirring (laughs) up shit. Maybe you'll get some good hate out of it. Oh, I hope so. (laughs) All right, brother man. Well, as always... Good talking to you. Have a great summer. And uh, we will, of course, talk personally more often than that. But uh, we'll have to have you on again uh, for that next season, for that other episode. Yeah, I'll do the episode with the best hidden, fun, cool guy classes you can take for about 500 bucks. Awesome, dude. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks a lot. I'll catch up with you soon, all right? Show notes, links to James, and other resources can be found by visiting in the rabbithole.com slash e. 17. Sign up for the ITRH Roving Horde Armada to get members only benefits and support the show. Go to itrh.net to find out more. In the Rabbit Hole isn't cheap to run, and we've kept going nearly entirely by supporting ITRH Armada members just like you. Visit itrh.net today to help us keep delivering survival and preparedness goodness to you. 
That's ITRH.net. With that, we wrap up episode number 217 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. <laughs>